Act One of Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters First Longshoreman, read by John Glover. Second Longshoreman, read by Marty Chris. Larry, a bartender, read by Matthew Reese. Johnny the Priest, a saloon owner. Read by Nolophidian. A Postman by Max Schörlinge. Chris Christofferson. Read by Lars Rolander. Marthy Owen. Read by Pat Redstone. Anna Christofferson. Read by Elizabeth Klett. Matt Burke. Read by Tyg Hines. Narrated by David Goldfarb. Scene. Johnny the Priest's Saloon, near South Street, New York City. The stage is divided into two sections, showing a small back room on the right. On the left, forward of the bar room, a large window looking out on the street. Beyond it, the main entrance, a double swinging door. Farther back, another window. The bar runs from left to right nearly the whole length of the rear wall. In back of the bar, a small showcase displaying a few bottles of case goods, for which there is evidently little call. The remainder of the rear space in front of the large mirrors is occupied by half-barrels of cheap whiskey of the Nicola Schott variety, from which the liquor is drawn by means of spigots. On the right is an open doorway leading to the back room. In the back room are four round wooden tables, with five chairs grouped about each. In the rear, a family entrance opening on a side street. It is late afternoon of a day in fall. As the curtain rises, Johnny is discovered. Johnny the priest deserves his nickname. With his pale, thin, clean-shaven face, mild blue eyes, and white hair, a cassock would seem more suited to him than the apron he wears. Neither his voice nor his general manner dispel this illusion, which has made him a personage of the waterfront. They are soft and bland. But beneath all his mildness, one senses the man behind the mask— cynical callous hard as nails he is lounging at ease behind the bar a pair of spectacles on his nose reading an evening paper two longshoremen enter from the street wearing their working aprons the button of the union pinned conspicuously on the caps pulled sideways on their heads at an aggressive angle as they range themselves at the bar give me a shock number two he tosses a coin on the bar same here Johnny sets two glasses of barrel whiskey before them. Here's luck. The other nods. They gulp down their whiskey, putting money on the bar. Give us another. Give me a scoop this time. Lager and porter. I'm dry. Same here. Johnny draws the lager and porter and sets the big foaming schooners before them. They drink down half the contents and start to talk together hurriedly in low tones. The door on the left is swung open, and Larry enters. He is a boyish, red-cheeked, rather good-looking young fellow of twenty or so, nodding to Johnny. Hello, boss. Hello, Larry. With a glance at his watch. Just on time. Larry goes to the right behind the bar, takes off his coat, and puts on an apron. Oh, let's drink up. Get back to it. They finish their drinks and go out left. The postman enters as they leave. He exchanges nods with Johnny and throws a letter on the bar. Address care you, Johnny. Know him? Johnny picks up the letter, adjusting his spectacles. Larry comes and peers over his shoulders. Johnny reads very slowly. Christopher Christofferson. Squarehead name. Old Chris. That's who. Oh, sure. I was forgetting Chris carried a hell of a name like that. Letters come for him sometimes before I remember now. Long time ago, though. It'll get him all right, then. Sure thing. He comes here whenever he's in port. Sailor, eh? Captain of a goal barge. <laughs> Some job. Well, so long. So long. I'll see he gets it. The postman goes out. Johnny scrutinizes the letter. You got good eyes, Larry. Where's it from? St. Paul. That'll be in Minnesota, I'm thinking. Looks like a woman's writing, too, the old devil. He's got a daughter somewheres out west, I think he told me once. He puts the letter on the cash register. Come to think of it, I ain't seen old Chris in a dog's age. 
Putting his overcoat on, he comes around the end of the bar. Guess I'll be getting home. See you tomorrow. Good night to you, boss. As Johnny goes toward the street door, it is pushed open, and Christopher Christofferson enters. He is a short, squat, broad-shouldered man of about fifty, with a round, weather-beaten red face from which his light blue eyes peer short-sightedly, twinkling with a simple good humor. His large mouth, overhung by a thick, drooping yellow mustache, is childishly self-willed and weak, of an obstinate kindliness. A thick neck is jammed like a post into the heavy trunk of his body. His arms, with their big, hairy, freckled hands, and his stumpy legs, terminating in large, flat feet, are awkwardly short and muscular. He walks with a clumsy, rolling gait. His voice, when not raised in a hollow boom, is toned down to a sly, confidential half-whisper, with something vaguely plaintive in its quality. He is dressed in a wrinkled, ill-fitting dark suit of shore clothes, and wears a faded cap of grey cloth over his mop of grizzled blonde hair. Just now his face beams with a too blissful happiness, and he has evidently been drinking. He reaches his hand out to Johnny. Hello, Johnny. Have drink on me. Come on, Larry. Give us drink. Have one yourself. Putting his hand in his pocket. I got money. Plenty money. Johnny shakes Chris by the hand. Speak of the devil. We was just talking about you. Larry, coming to the end of the bar. Hello, Chris. Put it there. They shake hands. Give us drink. You got half a snoot full now. Where'd you get it? Other fellar on other borge, Irish fellar. He got bottle whiskey and we drunk it, just us two. Dot whiskey got kicked by Ingo. Ah, just come ashore. Give us drink, Larry. I was little drunk, not much. Just feel good. <laughs> My Josephine, come board the ship, long time I wait for you. The moon she shine, she looks just like you. Chee 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 chee. <laughs> to the accompaniment of this last, he waves his hand as if he were conducting an orchestra. <laughs> Same old Josie, eh, Chris? You don't know good song when you hear him. Italian feller on other boards, he lure me a dat. Give us drink. He throws change on the bar. What's your pleasure, gentlemen? Small beer, Larry. Whiskey number two. Larry, as he gets their drinks. I'll take a cigar on you. Chris, lifting his glass. Skull. He drinks. Drink hearty. Have other drink. No, some other time. Got to go home now. So you've just landed? Where are you in from this time? Norfolk. We make slow voyage, dirty weather, just fog, 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 all bloody time. There is an insistent ring from the doorbell at the family entrance in the back room. Chris gives a start. I go open, Larry. I forgot. It was Marty. She come with me. He goes into the back room. <laughs> He's still got that same cow living with him, the old fool. A sport, Chris is. Well, I'll beat it home. So long. He goes to the street door. So long, boss. Oh, don't forget to give him his letter. I won't. Johnny goes out. In the meantime, Chris has opened the family entrance door, admitting Marthy. She might be forty or fifty. Her jowly, mottled face with its thick red nose is streaked with interlacing purple veins. Her thick gray hair is piled anyhow in a greasy mop on top of her round head. Her figure is flabby and fat. Her breath comes in wheezy gasps. She speaks in a loud, mannish voice, punctuated by explosions of hoarse laughter. But there still twinkles in her bloodshot blue eyes a youthful lust for life which hard usage has failed to stifle, a sense of humor mocking but good-tempered. She wears a man's cap, double-breasted man's jacket, and a grimy calico skirt. Her bare feet are encased in a man's brogans several sizes too large for her, which gives her a shuffling, wobbly gait. What you trying to do, Dutchy? Keep me standing out there all day? She comes forward and sits at the table in the right corner front. I'm sorry, Marty. I talked to Johnny. I forgot. What you going take for drink? Give me a scoop of lager and ale. I go bring him back. He returns to the bar. 
Lager and ale for Morty, Larry. Whiskey for me. He throws change on the bar. Right you are. Then, remembering, he takes the letter from in back of the bar. Here's a letter for you, from St. Paul, Minnesota. And a lady's writing. He grins. Chris, quickly, taking it. Oh, then it come from my daughter Anna. She lived there. He turns the letter over in his hands uncertainly. I don't got letter from Anna. Must be a year. That's a fine fairy tale to be telling, your daughter. Sure, I'll bet it's some bum. No, this come from Anna. Engrossed by the letter in his hand, uncertainly. By golly, I tank I'm too drunk for read this letter from Anna. I tank I sat down for a minute. You bring drinks in back room, Larry. He goes into the room on right. Where's my lager and ale, you big stiff? Larry, bring him. He sits down opposite her. Larry brings in the drinks and sets them on the table. He and Marthy exchange nods of recognition. Larry stands looking at Chris curiously. Marthy takes a long draught of her schooner and heaves a huge sigh of satisfaction, wiping her mouth with the back of her hand. Chris stares at the letter for a moment, slowly opens it and, squinting his eyes, commences to read laboriously, his lips moving as he spells out the words. As he reads, his face lights up with an expression of mingled joy and bewilderment. Good news? What's that you got? A letter? For God's sake. Pauses for a moment, after finishing the letter, as if to let the news sink in, then suddenly pounds his fist on the table with happy excitement. Pai Jiminy, just tank, Anna says she's coming here right away. She got sick on job in St. Paul, she say. It's short letter, don't tell me much more than that. Pai golly, that's good news all at one time for old feller. You know, Marty, I've told you I don't see my Anna since she was little girl in Sweden, five year old. How old does she be now? She must be, let me see, she must be twenty year old, Pai yo. You've not seen her in fifteen years? No, when she was little girl. I was bosun on Windjammer. I never got home only few time dem year. I'm full sailor feller. My woman Anna's mother, she got tired wait all time Sweden for me when I don't never come. She come this country, bring Anna, they go out Minnesota, live with her cousins on farm. Then when her mother die, when I was on voyage, I think it's better them cousins keep Anna. I think it's better Anna live on farm. Then she don't know that old devil see. She don't know father like me. Larry, with a wink at Marthy. This girl now be marrying a sailor herself, likely. It's in the blood. Chris, suddenly springing to his feet and smashing his fist on the table in a rage. No, by God, she don't do that. Marthy, grasping her schooner hastily. Hey, look out, you nut! Want to spill my suds for me? Oh-ho, what's up with you? Ain't you a sailor yourself now and always been? That's just why I say it. Sailor of us all right feller, but not for Mary Gale. No, I know that. Anna's mother, she know it too. When is your daughter coming? Soon? By Jiminy, I forgot. Reads through the letter hurriedly. She says she come right away, that's all. She'll maybe be coming here to look for you, I suppose. He returns to the bar, whistling. Left alone with Marthy, who stares at him with a twinkle of malicious humor in her eyes, Chris suddenly becomes desperately ill at ease. He fidgets, then gets up hurriedly. I got speak with Larry. I be right back. I bring you other drink. Marthy, emptying her glass. Sure, that's me. <laughs> As he retreats with the glass, she guffaws after him derisively. Pai Jingo, I got got Marty shore of barge before Anna come. Anna rise hell if she find that out. Marty rise hell too, for go by golly. <laughs> Serve you right, you old devil, having a woman at your age. 
you tell me lie for tal marty larry so's she got off barge quick she knows your daughter's coming tell her to get the hell out of it no i don't like make her feel bad you're an old mush keep your girl away from the barge then she'll likely want to stay ashore anyway what does she work at your anna she stay on them cousins farm till two year ago then she got job nurse girl in st paul but i don't want her got job now i want for her stay with me on a coal barge she'll not like that i'm thinking don't i get that bucket of suds dutchy yes i come marty <laughs> now you're in for it you'd better tell her straight to get out chris shaking in his boots by golly he takes her drink into marthy and sits down at the table she sips it in silence larry moves quietly close to the partition to listen grinning with expectation chris seems on the verge of speaking hesitates gulps down his whiskey desperately as if seeking for courage <coughs> marthy stares at him keenly taking in his embarrassment with a malicious twinkle of amusement in her eye uh, marthy was that then pretending to fly into a rage her eyes enjoying chris's misery i'm wise to what's in back of your nut dutchy you want to get rid of me, oh, now she's coming. Give me the booms rush ashore, huh? Let me tell you, Dutchy, there ain't a square head working on a boatman enough to get away with that. Don't start nothing you can't finish. I don't start nothing, Marty. Oh, you're a scream, a square head, an honest her god knockout. <laughs> I don't see nothing for laugh at. Take a slant in the mirror and you'll see. <laughs> a squarehead trying to kid Marthy Owen at this late day. After me camping with bargemen the last twenty years, I'm wise to the game up and down and sideways. I ain't been born and dragged up on the waterfront for nothing. Think I'd make trouble, huh? Not me. I'll pick up me duds and beat it. I'm quitting you, get me? I'm telling you I'm sick of sticking with you, and I'm leaving you flat, see? There's plenty of other guys on other barges waiting for me. Always was, I always found. She claps the astonished Chris on the back. So cheer up, Dutchy. I'll be off in the barge before she comes. You'll be rid of me for good and me of you. Good riddance for both of us. <laughs> I don't thank that. You was good girl, Morty. Good girl. Oh, can the bull. Well, you treated me square yourself, so it's 50-50. Nobody saw it and nobody. We're still good friends, huh? Larry returns to the bar. Chris, beaming now that he sees his troubles disappearing. Yes, by golly. That's the talking. In all my time, I tried never to split with a guy with no hard feelings. But what was you so scared about? That I'd kick up a row. That ain't Marthy's way. Think I'd break my heart to lose you. Commit suicide, huh? Oh, oh, God, the world's full of men, if that's all I'd worry about. Then, with a grin, after emptying her glass. Blow me to another scoop, huh? I'll drink to your kid's health for you. Sure, Tang. I go got him. He takes the two glasses into the bar. Other drink, same for both. Larry, getting the drinks and putting them on the bar. She's not such a bad lot, that one. She's good, gal. I tell you, by golly, I'd sell up right now. Give me whiskey here at bar, too. He puts down money. Larry serves him. You have drink, Larry. You know I never touch it. You don't know what you miss, school? Mm, ta -da -da, my Josephine, come o'er the ship. He picks up the drinks for Marthy and himself and walks unsteadily into the back room, singing. The moon she shines, she looks just like you. Chee 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 chee. Marthy, grinning, hands to ears. God! 
I'm good singer, yes. We drink, eh? School? I celebrate. I celebrate cause Anna's coming home, you know, Marty. I never write for her to come, cause I think I'm no good for her. But all time I hope, like hell, some day she won't want for see me, and then she come. And that's why it happened now, by Jiminy. What you think she look like, Marty? I bet you she's fine, good, strong girl, pooty like hell. Living on farm made her like that. And I bet you some day she marry good, steady land feller here in East. Have home all her own, have kids, and then I'm old grandfather, by golly. And I go visit them every time I got in port near. <laughs> oh, by Jiminy Crickens, I celebrate that. Bring other drink, Larry. He smashes his fist on the table with a bang. Larry, coming in from bar. Easy there. Don't be breaking the table, you old goat. My Josephine can't board the ship. You're soused to the ears, Dutchy. Go out and put a feed into you. It'll sober you up. Then, as Chris shakes his head obstinately, Listen, you old nut. You don't know what time your kid's liable to show up. You want to be sober when she comes, don't you? Chris, aroused, gets unsteadily to his feet. By golly, yes. That's good sense for you. A good beef stew will fix you. Go round the corner. All right. I'll be back soon, Marty. Chris goes through the bar and out the street door. He'll come round all right with some grub in him. Sure. Larry goes back to the bar and resumes his newspaper. Marthy sips what is left of her schooner reflectively. There is the ring of the family entrance bell. Larry comes to the door and opens it a trifle, then, with a puzzled expression, pulls it wide. Anna Christofferson enters. She is a tall, blonde, fully developed girl of twenty, handsome after a large Viking daughter fashion, but now run down in health and plainly showing all the outward evidences of belonging to the world's oldest profession. Her youthful face is already hard and cynical beneath its layer of makeup. Her clothes are the tawdry finery of peasant stock turned prostitute. She comes and sinks wearily in a chair by the table, left front. Give me a whiskey. Ginger ale on the side. Then, as Larry turns to go, forcing a winning smile at him. And don't be stingy, baby. Shall I serve it in a pail? <laughs> that suits me down to the ground. Larry goes into the bar. The two women size each other up with frank stares. Larry comes back with the drink, which he sets before Anna, and returns to the bar again. Anna downs her drink at a gulp. Then, after a moment, as the alcohol begins to rouse her, she turns to Marthy with a friendly smile. Ah, <sighs> Gee, I needed that bad. All right, all right. Marthy, nodding her head sympathetically. Sure, you look all in. Been on a bat? No, traveling. Day and a half on the train. Had to sit up all night in the dirty coach, too. God, I thought I'd never get here. Marthy, with a start, looking at her intently. Where'd you come from, huh? St. Paul, out in Minnesota. So, you're... All the way from Minnesota, sure. What you laughing at? Me? No, honest kid. I, I was thinking of something else. Well, I wouldn't blame you at that. Guess I do look rotten. Just out of the hospital two weeks. I'm gonna have another ski. What do you say? Have something on me. Sure I will. Thanks. Hey, Larry! Little service! He comes in. Same for me. Same here. Larry takes their glasses and goes out. Why don't you come sit over here? Be sociable. I'm a dead stranger in this burg, and I ain't spoke a word with no one since day before yesterday. Sure thing. She shuffles over to Anna's table and sits down opposite her. Larry brings the drinks, and Anna pays him. Skull, here's how. She drinks. Here's luck. She takes a gulp from her schooner. Anna. 
taking a package of sweet caporal cigarettes from her bag. They smoke in here, won't they? Sure. Only throw it away if you hear someone coming. Anna, lighting one and taking a deep inhale. <sighs> Gee, they're fussy in this dump, ain't they? She puffs, staring at the tabletop. Marthy looks her over with a new, penetrating interest, taking in every detail of her face. Anna suddenly becomes conscious of this appraising stare. Ain't nothing wrong with me, is there? You're looking hard enough. Ain't got to look much. I got your number the minute you stepped in the door. Ain't you smart. Well, I got yours, too, without no trouble. You're me, forty years from now. That's you. Is that so? Well, I'll tell you straight, kiddo, that Marthy Owen never... She catches herself up short with a grin. What are you and me scrapping over? Let's cut it out, huh? Me, I don't want no hard feelings with no one. Shake and forget it, huh? Anna shakes her hand gladly. Only too glad to. I ain't looking for trouble. Let's have another. What do you say? Not for mine. I'm all full up. And you? Had anything to eat lately? Not since this morning on the train. Then you better go easy on it, hadn't you? Guess you're right. I gotta meet someone, too. But my nerves is on edge after that rotten trip. You said you was just out of the hospital? Two weeks ago. Leaning over to Marthy confidentially. The joint I was in out in St. Paul got raided. That was the start. The judge give us girls thirty days. The others didn't seem to mind being in the cooler much. Some of them was used to it. But me, I couldn't stand it. Got my goat right. Couldn't eat or sleep or nothing. I never could stand being caged up nowheres. I got good and sick and they had to send me to the hospital. It was nice there. I was sorry to leave it, honest. Did you say you got to meet someone here? Yes. Oh, not what you mean. It's my old man I got to meet. Honest. It's funny, too. I ain't seen him since I was a kid. Don't even know what he looks like. Just had a letter every now and then. This was always the only address he give me to write him back. He's janitor of some building here now. Used to be a sailor. Janitor? Sure. And I was thinking, maybe, seeing he ain't never done a thing for me in my life, he might be willing to stake me to a room and eat till I get rested up. <sighs> Gee, I sure need that rest. I'm knocked out. But I ain't expecting much from him. Give you a kick when you're down, that's what all men do. Men. I hate them. All of them. And I don't expect he'll turn out no better than the rest. Say, do you hang out round this dump much? Oh, off and on. Then maybe you know him. My old man. Or at least seen him. It ain't old Chris, is it? Old Chris? Chris Christofferson, his full name is. Yes, that's him. Anna Christofferson, that's my real name, only out there I called myself Anna Christie. So you know him, eh? Seen him about for years. Say, what's he like? Tell me, honest. Oh, he's short and... I don't care what he looks like. What kind is he? Well, you can bet your life, kid. He's as good an old guy as ever walked on two feet. That goes. I'm pleased to hear it. Then you think he'll stake me to that rest cure I'm after? Surest thing you know. But where'd you get the idea he was a janitor? He wrote me he was himself. Well, he was lying. He ain't. He's captain of a barge. Five men under him. A barge? What kind of a barge? Coal, mostly. A coal barge? <laughs> oh, if that ain't a swell job to find your long-lost old man working at. Gee, I knew something be bound to turn out wrong. Always does with me. That puts my idea of his giving me a rest on the bum. What do you mean? I suppose he lives on the boat, don't he? Sure, what about it? Can't you live on it too? Me? On a dirty coal barge? What do you think I am? What do you know about barges, huh? Bet you ain't never seen one. That's what comes of his bringing you up inland, away from the old devil's sea where you'll be safe. God! <laughs> his bringing me up? Is that what he tells people? I like his nerve. 
He let them cousins of my old woman's keep me on their farm and work me to death like a dog. Well, he's got queer notions on some things. I've heard him say a farm was the best place for a kid. Oh, sure. That's what he'd always answer back. And a lot of crazy stuff about staying away from the sea. Stuff I couldn't make head or tail to. I thought he must be nutty. He is on that one point. So you didn't fall for life on the farm, huh? I should say not. The old man of the family, his wife and four sons, I had to slave for all of them. I was only a poor relation, and they treated me worse than they dare treat a hired girl. It was one of the sons, the youngest, started me when I was sixteen. After that I hated him so I'd killed him all if I'd stayed. So I run away to St. Paul. I've heard old Chris talk about you being a nurse girl out there. Was that all a bluff you put up when you wrote him? Not on your life it wasn't. It was true for two years. I didn't go wrong all at one jump. Being a nurse girl was just what finished me. Taking care of other people's kids, always listening to their bawling and crying, caged in. When you're only a kid yourself and want to go out and see things. At last I got the chance to get into that house. And you bet your life I took it. And I ain't sorry neither. It was all men's fault. The whole business. It was men on the farm ordering and beating me and giving me the wrong start. Then when I was a nurse, it was men again hanging around, bothering me, trying to see what they could get. <laughs> and now it's men all the time. God, I hate them all. Every mother's son of them. Don't you? Oh, I don't know. There's good ones and bad ones, kid. You just had a run of bad luck with them, that's all. Your old man now, old Chris, he's a good one. He'll have to show me. You kept right on writing him you was a nurse girl still, even after you was in the house, didn't you? Sure. Not that I think he'd care a darn. You're all wrong about him, kid. I know old Chris well for a long time. He's talked to me about you lots of times. He thinks the world of you. Honest, he does. Oh, quit the kidding. Honest? Only he's a simple old guy, see? He's got nutty notions, but he means well. Honest. Listen to me, kid. She is interrupted by the opening and shutting of the street door in the bar, and by hearing Chris's voice. Shh! What's up? Chris, who has entered the bar. He seems considerably sobered up. By golly, Larry, that grub tastes good. Martin back? Sure, and another tramp with her. Chris starts for the entrance to the back room. That's him now. He's coming in here. Brace up. Who? Chris opens the door. Why, hello, old Chris. Then, before he can speak, she shuffles hurriedly past him into the bar, beckoning him to follow her. Come here, I want to tell you something. He goes out to her. She speaks hurriedly in a low voice. Listen, I'm going to beat it down to the barge, pack up me duds and blow. That's her in there. Your Anna, just come waiting for you. Treat her right, see. She's been sick. Well, so long. She goes into the back room to Anna. So long, kid. I gotta beat it now. See you later. So long. Marthy goes quickly out of the family entrance. Well, what's up now? Nothing, nothing. He stands before the door to the back room in an agony of embarrassed emotion. Then he forces himself to a bold decision, pushes open the door and walks in. He stands there, casts a shy glance at Anna, whose brilliant clothes and, to him, high-toned appearance awe him terribly. He looks about him with pitiful nervousness, as if to avoid the appraising look with which she takes in his face, his clothes, etc., his voice seeming to plead for her forbearance. Anna! Hello, father. She told me it was you. I just got here a little while ago. Chris goes slowly over to her chair. It's good for see you after all them years, Anna. He bends down over her. After an embarrassed struggle, they manage to kiss each other. It's good to see you, too. Chris grasps her arms and looks into her face, then, overcome by a wave of fierce tenderness. 
Anna Lilla, Anna Lilla. Takes her in his arms. Anna shrinks away from him, half frightened. What's that? Swedish? I don't know it. Then, as if seeking relief from the tension in a voluble chatter. <sighs> Gee, I had an awful trip coming here. I'm all in. I had to sit up in the dirty coach all night. Couldn't get no sleep hardly. And then I had a hard job finding this place. i never been in New York before, you know, and... Chris, who has been staring down at her face admiringly, not hearing what she says, impulsively. You know you was awful potty girl, Anna. I bet all men see you fall in love with you, Piemini. Cut it. You talk same as they all do. Ain't no harm for your father talk that way, Anna. <sighs> No, of course not. Only, it's funny to see you and not remember nothing. You're like a stranger. I suppose I never come home only a few times when you was kid in Sweden. You don't remember that? No. But why didn't you never come home them days? Why didn't you never come out west to see me? I thank after your mother die when I was away on voyage. It's better for you you don't never see me. He sinks down in the chair opposite her dejectedly, then turns to her, sadly. I don't know, Anna, why I never come home Sweden in all year. I won't come home and of every voyage. I won't see your mother, your two brother before they was drowned, you when you was born, but I don't go. I sign on other ships, go South America, go Australia, go China, go every port all over world many times, but I never go aboard ship sail for Sweden. When I got money for pay passage home as passenger then, I forgot and I spend all money. When I tank again it's too late. I don't know why, but that's way with most sailor feller, Anna. That old devil see make them crazy fools with her dirty tricks. It's so. Then you think the sea's to blame for everything, eh? Well, you're still working on it, ain't you? Spite of all you used to write me about hating it. That dame was here told me you was captain of a coal barge. And you wrote me you was janitor of a building. No, I work on land long time as janitor. Just short time ago, I got this job cause I was sick, need open air. Sick? You? You'd never think it. And Anna, this ain't real sailor job. This ain't real boat on sea. She's just old tub, like piece of land with house on it that float. Job on her ain't sea job. No, I don't get job on sea, and if I die first, I swear that when your mother die, I keep my word by Jingo. Well, I can't see no difference. Speaking of being sick, I've been there myself. You started the hospital two weeks ago. You, Anna, by golly. You feel better now, though, don't you? You look little tired, that's all. I am. Tired to death. I need a long rest, and I don't see much chance of getting it. What do you mean, Anna? Well, when I made up my mind to come see you, I thought you was a janitor, that you'd have a place where maybe if you didn't mind having me, I could visit a while and rest up, till I felt able to get back on the job again. But I got place, Anna, nice place. You rest all you want by Jiminy. You don't never have to work as nurse girl no more. You stay with me, by golly. Then... You're really glad to see me? Honest? Chris, pressing one of her hands in both of his. Anna, I like see you like hell, I tell you. And don't you talk no more about getting job. You stay with me. I don't see you for a long time. You don't forget that. I'm getting old. I got no one in world but you. Thanks. It sounds good to hear someone talk to me that way. Say, though, if you're so lonely, it's... it's funny. Why ain't you never married again? I love your mother too much for ever do that, Anna. I don't remember nothing about her. 
What was she like? Tell me. I tell you all about every tongue, and you tell me all tongues happen to you. But not here now. This ain't good place for young gal anyway. Only no good sailor feller come here for got drunk. He gets to his feet quickly and picks up her bag. You come with me, Anna. You need lie down, get dressed. Anna half rises to her feet, then sits down again. Where are you going? Come, we get on board. On board your barge, you mean? Nix for mine. Then, seeing his crestfallen look, forcing a smile. Do you think that's a good place for a young girl like me? A coal barge? Yes, I thank. You don't know how nice it's on barge, Anna. Tug come and we got out, out on voyage. Just water all round and sun and fresh air. And good grub for make you strong, healthy gal. You see, many tongues you don't see before. You get moonlight at night, maybe. See steamer pass, see schooner make sail. See every tongue that's putty. You need take rest like that. You work too hard for young girl already. You need vacation, yes. <laughs> Sounds good to hear you tell it. I'd sure like a trip on the water, all right. It's the barge idea has me stopped. Well, I'll go down with you and have a look. And maybe I'll take a chance. Gee, I'd do anything once. Chris picks up her bag again. Ye go, eh? What's the rush? Wait a second. Forgetting the situation for a moment, she relapses into the familiar form and flashes one of her winning trade smiles at him. Gee, I'm thirsty. Chris sets down her bag immediately. I'm sorry, Anna. What you think you like for drink, eh? I'll take a... Uh, I don't know. What do they got here? I don't think they got much fancy drink for young girl in this place, Anna. Ginger ale, sarsaparilla, maybe. <laughs> Make it sass, then. I tell you, Anna, we celebrate, yes, this one time because we meet after many year. They got good port wine, Anna. It's good for you, I thank, little bit, for give you appetite. It ain't strong, neither. One glass don't go to your head, I promise. <laughs> All right, I'll take port. I go get him. He goes out to the bar. As soon as the door closes, Anna starts to her feet, picking up her bag. Oh, God, I can't stand this. I better beat it. Then she lets her bag drop, stumbles over to her chair again, and, covering her face with her hands, begins to sob. <laughs> Larry, putting down his paper as Chris comes up, with a grin. Well, who's the blonde? That was Anna, Larry. Your daughter, Anna? Chris nods. <whistles> Don't you think she was putty girl, Larry? Larry, rising to the occasion. Sure, a peach. You bet you. Give me drink for tight back. One port wine for Anna. She celebrate this one time with me. And small beer for me. Larry, as he gets the drinks. Small beer for you, eh? She's reforming you already. You bet. He takes the drinks. As she hears him coming, Anna hastily dries her eyes, tries to smile. Chris comes in and sets the drinks down on the table. Stares at her for a second anxiously, patting her hand. You look tired, Anna. Well, I make you take good long rest now. Picking up his beer. Come, you drink wine. It's put new life in you. She lifts her glass. He grins. Skål, Anna. You know that Swedish word? Skål. Downing her port at a gulp like a drink of whiskey, her lips trembling. Skål? Yes, I know that word. All right, all right. The curtain falls. End of Act One. Act Two of Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene. Ten days later. The stern of the deeply laden barge Simeon Winthrop, at anchor in the outer harbor of Provincetown, Massachusetts. It is ten o'clock at night. Dense fog shrouds the barge on all sides, and she floats motionless on a calm. A lantern set up on an immense coil of thick hawser sheds a dull, filtering light on objects near it, the heavy steel bits for making fast the tow-lines, etc. In the rear is the cabin, its misty windows glowing wanly with the light of a lamp inside. The chimney of the cabin stove rises a few feet above the roof. The doleful tolling of bells on long point, on ships at anchor, breaks the silence at regular intervals. As the curtain rises, Anna is discovered, standing near the coil of rope on which the lantern is placed. She looks healthy, transformed. The natural color has come back to her face. She has on a black oilskin coat, but wears no hat. She is staring out into the fog astern with an expression of awed wonder. The cabin door is pushed open, and Chris appears. He is dressed in yellow oilskins, coat, pants, sou'wester, and wears high sea-boots. Chris, the glare from the cabin still in his eyes, peers blinkingly astern. Anna! Receiving no reply, he calls again, this time with apparent apprehension. Anna! Anna, with a start, making a gesture with her hand as if to impose silence. Yes, here I am. What do you want? Chris walks over to her. Don't you come turning, Anna. It's light. After four bells. It ain't good for you stay out here in fog, I tank. Why not? I love this fog. Honest, it's so... funny and still. I feel as if I was out of things altogether. Chris, spitting disgustedly. Fog's worst one of her dirty tricks by Dingo. <laughs> Beefing about the sea again. I'm getting so as I love it, the little I've seen. Chris, glancing at her moodily. That's foolish talk, Anna. You see her more, you don't talk that way. Then, seeing her irritation, he hastily adopts a more cheerful tone. But I'm glad you like it on board. I'm glad it makes you feel good again. With a placating grin. You like live like this alone with old father, eh? Sure I do. Everything's been so different from anything I ever come across before. And now, this fog. <sighs> Gee, I wouldn't have missed it for nothing. I never thought living on ships was so different from land. Gee, I'd just love to work on it. Honest I would if I was a man. I don't wonder you always been a sailor. I ain't sailor, Anna, and this ain't real sea. You only see nice port. Then as she doesn't answer, he continues hopefully. Well, fog lift in morning, I thank. I'd love it. I don't give a rap if it never lifts. Chris fidgets from one foot to the other worriedly. It makes me feel clean, out here, as if I'd taken a bath. You better go in cabin, read book, that put you to sleep. I don't want to sleep. I want to stay out here and, and think about things. Chris walks away from her toward the cabin, then comes back. You act funny tonight, Anna. Say, what are you trying to do, make things rotten? You've been as kind as kind can be to me, and I certainly appreciate it, only don't spoil it all now. Then, seeing the hurt expression on her father's face, she forces a smile. Let's talk of something else. Come, sit down here. She points to the coil of rope. Chris sits down beside her with a sigh. It's getting pretty late in night, Anna. Must be near five bells. Five bells? What time is that? Half past ten. Funny. I don't know nothing about sea talk. But those cousins was always talking crops and that stuff. Gee, wasn't I sick of it. And of them. You don't like live on far, Anna? I've told you a hundred times I hated it. I'd rather have one drop of ocean than all the farms in the world. Honest. And you wouldn't like a farm, neither. Here's where you belong. She makes a sweeping gesture seaward. But not on a coal barge. You belong on a real ship, sailing all over the world. I've done that many year, Anna, when I was damn fool. Oh, rats. 
Was the men in our family always sailors, as far back as you know about? Yes, damn fools. All men in our village on coast Sweden go to sea. Ain't nothing else for them to do. My father died on board ship in Indian Ocean. He's buried at sea. I don't never know him, only a little bit. Then my three brother, old and me, they go on ships. Then I go too. Then my mother, she's left all alone. She died pretty quick after that, all alone. We was all away on voyage when she died. To my brother, they got lost on fishing boat, same like your brothers was drowned. My other brother, he saved money, give up sea. Then he die home in bed. He's only one that old devil don't kill. But me, I bet you I die ashore in bed too. Were all of them just plain sailors? Able body seamen, most of them. They was all smart seamen too, a one. I was bosun. Bosun? That's kind of officer. Gee, that was fine. What does he do? Hard work all time. It's rotten. I tell you, for go to sea. They're all fool feller, them feller in our family. They all work rotten job on sea for nothing. Don't care nothing but just get big paid day in pocket. Got drunk, get robbed, ship away again on other voyage. They don't come home. They don't do any tongue like good men do. And that old devil see, sooner or later she swallow them up. Good sports, I'd call them. But say, listen, did all the women of the family marry sailors? Pris, seeing a chance to drive home his point. Yes, and it's bad on them like hell, worst of all. They don't see their men only once in long while. They sit and wait all alone. And when their boys grows up, go to sea, they sit and wait some more. Any girl marry sailor, she's crazy fool. Your mother, she tell you same tongue if she was alive. He relapses into an attitude of somber brooding. Funny. I do feel sort of nutty tonight. I feel old. Old? Sure. Like I'd been living a long, long time out here in the fog. I don't know how to tell you just what I mean. It's like I'd come home after a long visit away someplace. It all seems like I'd been here before lots of times. On boats. In this same fog. <laughs> you must think I'm off my base. Anybody feel funny that way in fog? But why do you suppose I feel so... So... Like I'd found something I'd missed and been looking for. As if this was the right place for me to fit in. And I seem to have forgot everything that's happened. Like it didn't matter no more. And I feel clean somehow. Like a feel just after you took a bath. And I feel happy for once. Yes, honest, happier than I ever been anywhere before. As Chris makes no comment but a heavy sigh, she continues wonderingly. It's nutty for me to feel that way, don't you think? I thank I'm damn fool for bring you on voyage, Anna. You talk nutty tonight yourself. You act as if you was scared something was going to happen. Only God know that, Anna. Then it'll be God's will, like the preachers say. What does happen? Chris starts to his feet with fierce protest. No, that old devil see she ain't God. In the pause of silence that comes after his defiance, a hail in a man's husky, exhausted voice comes faintly out of the fog to port. Ahoy! Ho! What's that? Hi, golly, that scare me for a minute. It's only some feller hail, Anna, losing course in fog. Must be fisherman's power boat. His engine break down, I guess. The Ahoy! comes again through the wall of fog, sounding much nearer this time. Chris goes over to the port bulwark. Sound from this side. She come in from open sea. Ahoy there. What's trouble? The voice, this time sounding nearer, but up forward toward the bow. Eva rope when we come alongside. Ah, uh, where are you, you scut? 
I hear them rowing. They come up by bow, I thank. This way. Right you are. There is a muffled sound of oars in oarlocks. Why don't that guy stay where he belongs? I go up bow. All hands asleep. Septim feller on watch. I get heavy line to that feller. He picks up a coil of rope and hurries off toward the bow. Anna walks back toward the extreme stern, as if she wanted to remain as much isolated as possible. She turns her back on the proceedings and stares out into the fog. The voice is heard again, shouting, Aye! And Chris answering, This way. Then there is a pause, the murmur of excited voices, then the scuffling of feet. Chris appears from around the cabin to port. He is supporting the limp form of a man dressed in dungarees, holding one of the man's arms around his neck. The deckhand, Johnson, a young blond Swede, follows him, helping along another exhausted man in similar fashion. Anna turns to look at them. Chris stops for a second. Anna, you come help, will you? You find whiskey in cabin. These fellers need drink for fix them. They was near dead. Anna, hurrying to him. Sure, but who are they? What's the trouble? Sailor fellers, their steamer got wrecked. They've been five days in open boat. Four fellers. Only one left able stand up. Come, Anna. She precedes him into the cabin, holding the door open while he and Johnson carry in their burdens. The door is shut, then opened again as Johnson comes out. Chris's voice shouts after him. Go get other feller, Johnson. Yes, sir. He goes. The door is closed again. Matt Burke stumbles in around the port side of the cabin. He moves slowly, feeling his way uncertainly keeping hold of the port bulwark with his right hand to steady himself. He is stripped to the waist, has on nothing but a pair of dirty dungaree pants. He is a powerful, broad-chested six-footer, his face handsome in a hard, rough, bold, defiant way. He is about thirty, in the full power of his heavy-muscled, immense strength. His dark eyes are bloodshot and wild from sleeplessness, the muscles of his arms and shoulders are lumped in knots and bunches. The veins of his forearms stand out like blue cords. He finds his way to the coil of hawser and sits down on it facing the cabin, his back bowed, head in his hands, in an attitude of spent weariness, talking aloud to himself. Row, you devil, row. Then, lifting his head and looking about him. What's this tub? Well, we're safe anyway with the help of God. He makes the sign of the cross mechanically. Johnson comes along the deck to port, supporting the fourth man, who is babbling to himself incoherently. Burke glances at him disdainfully. Is it losing the small witch you ever had, you are deck-scrubbing Scott? They pass him and go into the cabin, leaving the door open. Burke sags forward wearily. I'm bait out, bait out entirely. Anna comes out of the cabin with a tumbler quarter full of whiskey in her hand. She gives a start when she sees Burke so near her, the light from the open door falling full on him. Then, overcoming what is evidently a feeling of repulsion, she comes up beside him. Here you are. Here's a drink for you. You need it, I guess. Burke, lifting his head slowly. Is it dreamin' I am? Drink it, and you'll find it ain't no dream. Well, the hell with a drink, but I'll take it just the same. He tosses it down. Ah, I'm needin' that, and it's fine stuff. Looking up at her, with frank, grinning admiration. It wasn't the booze I meant when I said was I dreaming. I thought you were some mermaid out of the sea come to torment me. He reaches out to feel of her arm. Ah, real flesh and blood, devil a less. Anna, stepping back from him. Cut that. But tell me, isn't this a barge I'm on, or isn't it? Sure. And what's a fine, handsome woman the like of you doing on this scow? Never you mind. Say, you're a great one, honest. Startin' right in kidding after what you been through. Ah, it was nothing. Easy for a rail man with guts to him the like of me. <laughs> all in a day's work, darling. But I won't be denying t'was a damn narrow squeak. We all ought to be with Davy Jones at the bottom of the sea, be rights. And only for me, I'm telling you, and the great strength and guts is in me, we'd be being scoffed by the fishes this minute. Gee, you hate yourself, don't you? Then, turning away from him indifferently, well, you'd better come in and lie down. You must want to sleep. Burke, stung, 
rising unsteadily to his feet with chest out and head thrown back. Oh, lie down and sleep, is it? A devil a wink I'm after having for two days and nights, and devil a bit I'm needing now. Let you not be thinking I'm the like of them three weak scuts come in the boat with me. I could lick the three of them sitting down with one hand tied behind me. They may be bait out, but I'm not. I've been rowing the boat with them lying in the bottom, not able to raise a hand for the last two days we was in it. Furiously, as he sees this is making no impression on her. And I can lick all hands on this tub, one by one, tired as I am. Gee, ain't you a hard guy. Then, with a trace of sympathy, as she notices him swaying from weakness. But never mind that fight talk. I'll take your word for all you've said. Go on and sit down out here anyway if I can't get you to come inside. He sits down weakly. You're all in. You might as well own up to it. The hell I am. Well, be stubborn then for all I care. And I must say I don't care for your language. The men I know don't pull that rough stuff when ladies are around. Burke, getting unsteadily to his feet again, in a rage. Ladies? Ha <laughs> ha. Divil mend you. Let you not be making game of me. What would ladies be doing on this bloody hulk? As Anna attempts to go to the cabin, he lurches into her path. Easy now. You're not the old square-heads woman, I suppose you'll be telling me next, living in this cabin with him, no less. Seeing the cold, hostile expression on Anna's face, he suddenly changes his tone to one of boisterous joviality. But I do be thinking, ever since the first look me eyes took at you, that it's a fool you are to be wasting yourself, a fine, handsome girl, on a stumpy runt of a man like that old Swede. There's too many strapping great lads on the sea would give their heart's blood for one kiss of you. Lads like you, eh? You take the words out of me mouth. I'm the proper lad for you, if it's meself to be saying it. With a quick movement he puts his arms about her waist. Wish now, me Daisy, himself's in the cabin. It's one of your kisses I'm needing to take the tiredness from me bones. One kiss now. He presses her to him and attempts to kiss her. Anna, struggling fiercely. Let go of me, you big mutt. She pushes him away with all her might. Burke, weak and tottering, is caught off his guard. He is thrown down backward and, in falling, hits his head a hard thump against the bulwark. He lies there, still, knocked out for the moment. Anna stands for a second, looking down at him frightenedly. Then she kneels down beside him and raises his head to her knee, staring into his face anxiously for some sign of life. Burke, stirring a bit, mutteringly. God, stiffen it. He opens his eyes and blinks up at her with vague wonder. Anna, letting his head sink back on the deck, rising to her feet with a sigh of relief. You're coming too, all right, eh? Gee, I was scared for a moment I'd killed you. Burke, with difficulty rising to a sitting position, scornfully. Killed, is it? It'd take more than a bit of a blow to crack my thick skull. Then, looking at her with the most intense admiration. But glory be. It's a power of strength as in them two fine arms of yours. There's not a man in the world could say the same as you, that has seen Matt Bourke lying at his feet and him dead to the world. Forget it. I'm sorry it happened, see? Burke rises and sits on bench. Only had no right to be getting fresh with me. Listen now, and don't go getting any more wrong notions. I'm on this barge because I'm making a trip with my father. The captain's my father. Now you know. The old square, the old Swede, I mean. Yes. Burke, rising, peering at her face. I'm sure I might have known it if I wasn't a bloody fool from birth. Where else do you get that fine yellow hair that's like a golden crown on your head? <laughs> Say nothing stops you, does it? But don't you think you ought to be apologizing for what you said and done just a minute ago, instead of trying to kid me with that mush? Mush? Then bending forward toward her with very intense earnestness. Indeed, and I will ask your pardon a thousand times, and on my knees if you like, I didn't mean a word of what I said or did. But devil a woman in all the ports of the world has ever made a great fool of me that way before. I see. You mean you're a lady killer, and they all fall for you. Leave off your fooling. Tis that is after getting me back up at you. It's no lie I'm telling you about the women, though it's a great jackass I am to be mistaking you, even in anger. For the like of them cows on the waterfront is the only women I've met up with since I was growed to a man. As Anna shrinks away from him at this, he hurries on pleadingly. I'm a hard, rough man, and I'm not fit, I'm thinking, to be kissing the shoe soles of a fine, decent girl the like of yourself. Tis only the ignorance of your kind made me see you wrong. So you'll forgive me for the love of God, and let us be friends from this out. 
and I'm thinking I'd rather be friends with you than have my wish for anything else in the world. He holds out his hand to her, shyly. Anna, looking queerly at him, perplexed and worried, but moved and pleased in spite of herself, takes his hand uncertainly. Sure. God bless you. In his excitement, he squeezes her hand tight. Ouch. Burke, hastily dropping her hand. Ah, oh, your pardon, miss. Tis a clumsy ape I am. Then, simply, glancing down his arm proudly. Tis great power I have in my hand and arm, and I do be forgetting it at times. Anna, nursing her crushed hand and glancing at his arm, not without a trace of his own admiration. Gee, you're some strong, all right. It is no lie, and why shouldn't I be, with me shoveling a million tons of coal in the stoke holes of ships since I was a lad only? He pats the coil of hawser invitingly. Let you sit down now, miss, and I'll be telling you a bit of myself, and you'll be telling me a bit of yourself, and in an hour we'll be as old friends as if we was born in the same house. He pulls at her sleeve, shyly. Sit down now, if you please. <sighs> well. She sits down. But we won't talk about me, see? You tell me about yourself and about the wreck. I'll tell you, surely. But can I be asking you one question, miss, has me head in a puzzle? Well, I don't know. What is it? What is it you do when you're not taking a trip with the old man? For I'm thinking a fine girl the like of you ain't living always on this tub. No, of course I ain't. She searches his face suspiciously, afraid there may be some hidden insinuation in his words. Seeing his simple frankness, she goes on confidently. Well, I'll tell you. I'm a governess, see? I take care of kids for people and learn them things. A governess, is it? You must be smart, surely. But let's not talk about me. Tell me about the wreck like you promised me you would. "'Twas this way, miss. Two weeks out we ran into the devil's own storm, and she sprang one hell of a leak up forward. The skipper was hoping to make Boston before another blow would finish her, but ten days back we met up with another storm the like of the first only worse. Four days we was in it with green seas raking over her from bow to stern. That was a terrible time, God help us. And if it wasn't for me and my great strength, I'm telling you, and it's God's truth, there'd been mutiny itself in the stoke hole. "'Twas me who held them to it, with a kick to one and a clout to another, "'and they're not caring a damn for the engineers any more, "'but fearing a clout on my right arm more than they fear the sea itself." He glances at her anxiously, eager for her approval. Anna, concealing a smile, amused by this boyish boasting of his. "'You did some hard work, didn't you?' "'Twas that I did. "'I'm a devil for sticking it out when them that's weak give up, "'but much good it did anyone.' "'Twas a mad fight and scramble in the last seconds with each man for himself. "'I just remember now how it came about. "'But there was the four of us in that one boat, "'and when we was raised high on a great wave, "'I took a look about, and devil a sight there was, "'a ship or men on top of the sea. "'Then all the others was drowned. "'Ah, there was, surely. "'Oh, what a terrible end. "'A terrible end for the likes of them swabs does live on land, maybe.' But for the likes of us to be roaming the seas, a good end, I'm telling you, quick and clean. Yes, clean. That's just the word for all of it, the way it makes me feel. The sea, you mean? I'm thinking you have a bit of it in your blood, too. Your old man wasn't only a barge rat, I'm begging your pardon, all his life by the cut of him. No, he was boatswain on sailing ships for years. And all the men on both sides of the family have gone to sea as far back as he remembers, he says. All the women have married sailors, too. Did they now? They had spirit in them. It's only on the sea you'd find rail men with guts as fit to wed with fine, high-tempered girls. The like yourself. <laughs> there you go, kidding again. Then, seeing his hurt expression, quickly. But you was going to tell me about yourself. You're Irish, of course I can tell that. Yes, thank God, though I've not seen a sight of it in fifteen years or more. Sailors never do go home hardly, do they? That's what my father was saying. He wasn't telling no lie. It's a hard and lonesome life, this he is. The only women you'd meet in the ports of the world who'd be willing to speak your kind word isn't woman at all. You know the kind I mean. And they're a poor, wicked lot, God forgive them. They're looking to steal the money from you only. Anna, her face averted, rising to her feet, agitatedly. I think... I guess I'd better see what's doing inside. Burke, afraid he has offended her, don't go, I'm saying. Is that I've given you offence with my talk of the like of them? Don't heed it at all. I'm clumsy in my wits when it comes to talking proper with a girl the like of you. 
and why wouldn't I be? Since the day I left home to go to see Punch and Coal, this is the first time I've had a word with a real decent woman. So don't turn your back on me now, and we beginning to be friends. Anna, turning to him again, forcing a smile. I'm not sore at you, honest. God bless you. But if you honestly think the sea's such a rotten life, why don't you get out of it? Work on the land, is it? She nods. He spits scornfully. Digging spuds in the muck from dawn till dark, I suppose. I wasn't made for it, miss. <laughs> I thought you'd say that. But there's good jobs and bad jobs at sea, like there'd be on land. I'm thinking if it's in the stokehole of a proper liner I was, I'd be able to have a little house and be home to it one week out of four. And I'm thinking that maybe then I'd have the luck to find a fine, decent girl, the like of yourself now, would be willing to wed with me. Anna, turning away from him. <laughs> Why, sure. Why not? Then you think a girl the like of yourself might maybe not mind the past at all, but only be seeing the good herself put in me? Why, sure. Oh, she'd not be sorry for it, I'll take my oath. Tis no more drinking and roving about I'd be doing then, but giving my pay into her hand and staying at home with her as meek as a lamb each night of the week I'd be in port. <laughs> All you gotta do is find the girl. I have found her. Huh, you have? When? I thought you was saying... This night, if she'd be having me. Tis you, I mean. <sighs> Say, are you going crazy? Are you trying to kid me? Proposing to me, for God's sake, on such short acquaintance? Chris comes out of the cabin and stands staring blinkingly astern. When he makes out Anna in such intimate proximity to this strange sailor, an angry expression comes over his face. Burke, following her, with fierce, pleading insistence. I'm telling you, there's the will of God in it that brought me safe through the storm and fog to the one spot in the world where you was. Think of that now, and isn't it queer? Anna! He comes toward them, raging, his fists clenched. Anna, you will get in cabin, you hear? Who do you think you're talking to? A slave? You need got rest, Anna. You got sleep. She does not move. He turns on Burke furiously. What you doing here, you sailor feller? You ain't sick like others. You got in focusle. They give you bunk. You hurry, I tell you. But he's sick. Look at him, he can hardly stand up. Burke, straightening and throwing out his chest with a bold laugh. Is it giving me orders, you army bucko? Let you look out, then. With one hand, weak as I am, I can break you in two and fling the pieces over the side, and your crew after you. But I was forgetting. You're her old man, and I'd not raise a fist to you for the world. His knees sag. He wavers and seems about to fall. Anna utters an exclamation of alarm and hurries to his side. Anna taking one of his arms over her shoulder. Come on in the cabin. You can have my bed if there ain't no other place. Burke, with jubilant happiness, as they proceed toward the cabin. Glory be to God. Is it holding my arm about your neck you are? Anna, Anna, sure it's a sweet name is suited to you. Anna, guiding him carefully. Shh, shh. Wished is it? Indeed, and I'll not. I'll be roaring it out like a foghorn over the sea. You're the girl of the world, and we'll be marrying soon, and I don't care who knows it. Anna, as she guides him through the cabin door. Shh! Never mind that talk. You go to sleep. They go out of sight in the cabin. Chris, who has been listening to Burke's last words with open-mouthed amazement, stands looking after them helplessly. Chris turns suddenly and shakes his fist out at the sea, with bitter hatred. That's your dirty trick, damn old devil, you. But, by God, you don't do that. Not while I'm living. No, by God, you don't. The curtain falls. End of Act Two. Act Three of Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene. The interior of the cabin on the barge Simeon Winthrop, at dock in Boston. A narrow, low-ceilinged compartment, the walls of which are painted a light brown with white trimmings. In the rear on the left, a door leading to the sleeping quarters. In the far left corner, a large locker closet, painted white, on the door of which a mirror hangs on a nail. 
In the rear wall, two small square windows and a door opening out on the deck toward the stern. In the right wall, two more windows looking out on the port deck. White curtains, clean and stiff, are at the windows. A table with two cane-bottomed chairs stands in the center of the cabin. A dilapidated wicker rocker, painted brown, is also by the table. It is the afternoon of a sunny day, about a week later. From the harbor and docks outside, muffled by the closed doors and windows, comes the sound of steamer's whistles and the puffing snort of the donkey engines of some ship unloading nearby. As the curtain rises, Chris and Anna are discovered. Anna is seated in the rocking chair by the table with a newspaper in her hands. She is not reading, but staring straight in front of her. She looks unhappy, troubled, frowningly concentrated on her thoughts. Chris wanders about the room, casting quick, uneasy side glances at her face, then stopping to peer absent-mindedly out of the window. His attitude betrays an overwhelming, gloomy anxiety which has him on tenterhooks. He pretends to be engaged in setting things ship-shape, but this occupation is confined to picking up some object, staring at it stupidly for a second, then aimlessly putting it down again. He clears his throat and starts to sing to himself in a low, doleful voice. <clears throat> My Josephine, come aboard the ship. Long time I wait for you. Anna, turning on him sarcastically. I'm glad someone's feeling good. <sighs> Gee, I sure wish she was out of this dump and back in New York. I'm glad when we sail again, too. Then, as she makes no comment, he goes on with a ponderous attempt at sarcasm. I don't see why you don't like Boston, though. You have good time here, I think. You go ashore all time every day and night week we've been here. You go to movies, see show, got all kinds of fun. All with that damn Irish feller. Oh, for heaven's sake, are you off on that again? Where's the harm in his taking me around? Do you want me to sit all day and night in this cabin with you and knit? Ain't I got a right to have as good a time as I can? It ain't right kind of fun, not with that feller, no. I've been back on board every night by eleven, ain't I? Then, struck by some thought, looks at him with keen suspicion, with rising anger. Say, look here, what do you mean by what you just said? Nothing but what I say, Anna. You said ain't right, and you said it funny. Say, listen here, you ain't try to insinuate that there's something wrong between us, are you? No, Anna, no. I swear to God, I never thank that. Anna, mollified by his very evident sincerity, sitting down again. Well, don't you never think it neither if you want me to ever speak to you again. If I ever dreamt you thought that, I'd get the hell out of this barge so quick you couldn't see me for dust. I would never dream. You was getting learned to swear. That ain't nice for young girl, you thank. Excuse me. You ain't used to such language, I know. That's what you're taking me to see is done for me. No, it ain't me. It's that damn sailor feller learn you bad thanks. He ain't a sailor. He's a stoker. That was million times worse, I tell you. Dumb fellers that worked below shoveling coal was the dirtiest rough gang of no good fellers in world. I'd hate to hear you say that to Matt. Oh, I tell him same tongue. You don't get it in head. I'm scared of him just cause he was stronger I was. You don't get for fight with fists with them fellers. There's other way for fix him. What do you mean? Nothing. He'd better not. I wouldn't start no trouble with him if I was you. He might forget some time that you was old and my father, and then you'd be out of luck. Well, just let him. I'm old bird, maybe, but I bet I show him trick or two. Come on, be good. What's eating you anyway? Don't you want no one to be nice to me except yourself? Yes, I do, Anna. Only not feller on sea. But I like for you marry steady feller. Got good job on land. You have little home in country all your own. Anna, rising to her feet. Oh, cut it out. Little home in the country. I wish you could have seen the little home in the country where you had me in jail till I was sixteen. Some day you're going to get me so mad with that talk, I'm going to turn loose on you and tell you a lot of things that'll open your eyes. I don't want. I know you don't. 
but you keep on talking just the same. I don't talk no more than I am. Then promise me you'll cut out saying nasty things about Matt Burke every chance you get. Why? You like that feller very much, Anna? Yes, I certainly do. He's a regular man, no matter what faults he's got. One of his fingers is worth all the hundreds of men I met out there, inland. Maybe you think you love him, then? What of it if I do? Maybe you think you marry him? No. Chris's face lights up with relief. If I'd met him four years ago, or even two years ago, I'd have jumped at the chance, I'll tell you that straight. And I would now. Only he's such a simple guy, a big kid, and I ain't got the heart to fool him. But don't never say again he ain't good enough for me. It's me ain't good enough for him. By Jiminy, you go crazy, I think. Well, I've been thinking I was myself the last few days. She goes and takes a shawl from a hook near the door and throws it over her shoulders. Guess I'll take a walk down to the end of the dock for a minute and see what's doing. I love to watch the ships passing. Matt'll be along before long, I guess. Tell him where I am, won't you? All right, I tell him. Anna goes out the doorway on rear. Chris follows her out and stands on the deck outside for a moment looking after her. Then he comes back inside and shuts the door. He stands looking out of the window, mutters, Dirty die de Viljo. Then he goes to the table, sets the cloth straight mechanically, picks up the newspaper Anna has let fall to the floor and sits down in the rocking chair. He stares at the paper for a while, then puts it on table, holds his head in his hands and sighs drearily. The noise of a man's heavy footsteps comes from the deck outside, and there is a loud knock on the door. Chris starts, makes a move as if to get up and go to the door, then thinks better of it and sits still. The knock is repeated. Then, as no answer comes, the door is flung open and Matt Burke appears. Chris scowls at the intruder, and his hand instinctively goes back to the sheath knife on his hip. Burke is dressed up, wears a cheap blue suit, a striped cotton shirt with a black tie, and black shoes, newly shined. His face is beaming with good humor. Well, God bless who's here. He bends down and squeezes his huge form through the narrow doorway. And how's the world treating you this afternoon, Anna's father? Pretty good, if it ain't for some fellers. Made in me, do you? Well, if you ain't the funny old crank of a man. Where's herself? Chris sits dumb, scowling, his eyes averted. Burke is irritated by this silence. Where's Anna, I'm after asking you? She go down end of dock. I'll be going down to her then. But first I'm thinking I'll take this chance when we're alone to have a word with you. He sits down opposite Chris at the table and leans over toward him. And that word is soon said. I'm marrying your Anna before this day is out, and you might as well make up your mind to it, whether you like it or no. Oh, that's easy for say. You mean, I won't? Is it the like of yourself will stop me, are you thinking? Yes, I stop it if it comes to worst. Oh, God help you. But ain't no need for me do that, Anna. Is it Anna you think will prevent me? Yes. And I'm telling you she'll not. She knows I'm loving her, and she loves me the same, and I know it. Ho, oh, ho, she only have fun. She make big fool of you, that's all. That's a lie in your throat, devil mend you. No, it ain't lie. She tell me just before she go out, she never marry feller like you. I not believe it. Tis a great old liar you are, and a devil to be making a power of trouble if you had your way. But it's not trouble I'm looking for on me sitting down here. Let us be talking it out now, as man to man. You're her father, and wouldn't it be a shame for us to be at each other's throats like a pair of dogs, and I married with Anna? So out with the truth, man alive. What is it you're holding against me at all? Chris, a bit placated in spite of himself by Burke's evident sincerity, but puzzled and suspicious. Well, I don't want for Anna got married. Listen, you feller, I'm a old man. I don't see Anna for fifteen year. She was all I got in world. And now when she come on first trip, you think I want her leave me alone again? Let you not be thinking I have no heart at all for the way you'd be feeling. Chris, astonished and encouraged, trying to plead persuasively. 
den you do right tang eh you ship away again leave anna alone big feller like you dat's on sea he don't need wife he got new gal in every port you know dat god stiffen you i'll not be giving you the lie on that but devil take you there's a time comes to every man on sea or land that isn't a born fool when he's sick of the lot of them cows and wearing his heart out to meet with a fine decent girl and to have a home to call his own and be rearing up children in it tis small use you're asking me to leave anna she's the one woman in the world for me and i can't live without her now i'm thinking you forgot all about her in one week out of port i bet you you don't know the like i am death itself wouldn't make me forget her so let you not be making talk to me about leaving her but not and be damned to you it won't be so bad for you as you make out at all she'll be living here in the states and her married to me and you'll be seeing her often so a sight more often than you ever saw her the fifteen years she was growing up in the west it's queer you'd be the one to be making great trouble about her leaving you when you never laid eyes on her once in all them years i thought it was better anna stay away grow up inland where she don't ever know old devil see there's a blame of the sea for your troubles you are again god help you well anna knows it now twas in our blood anyway and i don't want she ever know no good feller on sea she knows one now that's just it that's just what you are no good sailor feller you think i'll let her life be made sorry by you like her mother's was by me no i swear she don't marry you if i get kill you first <laughs> glory be to god it's bold talk you have for a stumpy runt of a man well you see i'll see surely i'll see myself at anna marry this day i'm telling you it's queer fooled blather you have about the seed on this and the seed on that you ought to be ashamed to be saying the like and you an old sailor yourself i'm after hearing a lot of it from you and a lot more that anna's told me you'd be saying to her and i'm thinking it's a poor weak thing you are and not a man at all you see if i'm a man maybe quicker'n you tank yeah don't be boasting i'm thinking it's out of your wits you've got with the fright of the sea you'd be wishing anna married to a farmer she told me that'd be a sweet match surely would you have a fine girl the like of anna lying down at nights with a muddy scut stinking of pigs and dung or would you have her tied for life to the like of them skinny shrivelled swabs that be working in cities that's lie you fool tis not tis your own mad notions i'm after telling but you know the truth in your heart if great fear of the sea has made you a liar and a coward itself the sea's the only life for a man with guts in him isn't afraid of his own shadow tis only on the sea he's free and him roving the face of the world seeing all things and not giving a damn for saving up money or stealing from his friends or any of the black tricks that a landlubber would waste his life on twas yourself knew it once and you were boasting for years you was crazy fool i tell you you've swallowed the anchor the sea give you a clout once knocked you down and you're not man enough to get up for another but lie there for the rest of your life howling bloody murder isn't it meself the sea has nearly drowned and me battered and bait till i was that close to hell i could hear the flames roaring and never a groan out of me till the sea gave up and it seeing the great strength and guts of a man was in me yes you was hell of feller hear you tell it you'll be calling me a liar once too often me old bucko wasn't the whole story of it and my picture itself in the newspapers of boston a week back <laughs> sure i'd like to see you and the best of your youth do the like of what i've done in the storm and after tis a mad lunatic screeching with fear you'd be this minute ho oh, oh, ho you was a young fool in all years when i was on windjammer i was through hundred storms worse than that ships was ships then and men that sail on them was real men and now what you got on steamers you got fellers on deck don't know ship from mudsco with a meaning glance at burke and below deck you got feller just know how for shovel coal might just as well work on coal wagon ashore is it casting insults at the men in the stoke hole ya are you old ape god stiffen you one of them is worth any ten stockfish swilling squareheads ever shipped on a windbag chris 
his face working with rage, his hand going back to the sheath knife on his hip. Irish swine, you! Don't you like the Irish, you old baboon? Tis that you're needin' in your family, I'm telling you. An Irish man and a man of the stoke-hole. To put guts in it so that you'll not be having grandchildren will be fearful cowards and jackasses, the like of yourself. Chris, half rising from his chair. You look out! And it's that you'll be having, no matter what you do to prevent. For Anna and me'll be married this day, and no fool the like of you will stop us when I've made up me mind. You don't! He throws himself at Burke, knife in hand, knocking his chair over backwards. Burke springs to his feet quickly in time to meet the attack. He laughs with the pure love of battle. The old Swede is like a child in his hands. Burke does not strike or mistreat him in any way, but simply twists his right hand behind his back and forces the knife from his fingers. He throws the knife into a far corner of the room, tauntingly. All men is getting childish shouldn't play with knives holding the struggling Chris at arm's length, with a sudden rush of anger drawing back his fist. I've half a mind to hit you a great clout will put sense into your square head. Keep off me now, I'm warning you. He gives Chris a push with the flat of his hand, which sends the old Swede staggering back against the cabin wall, where he remains standing, panting heavily, his eyes fixed on Burke with hatred, as if he were only collecting his strength to rush at him again. Now don't be coming at me again, I'm saying or I'll flatten you on the floor with a blow, if tis Anna's father yard itself. I've no patience left for you. Well, <laughs> tis a bold man yard just the same, and I'd never think it was in you to come tackling me alone. A shadow crosses the cabin windows. Both men start. Anna appears in the doorway. Hello, Matt. Are you here already? I was down— She stops, looking from one to the other, sensing immediately that something has happened. What's up? Then noticing the overturned chair— How'd that chair get knocked over? Turning on Burke reproachfully. You ain't been fighting with him, Matt, after you promised. But not laid a hand on him, Anna. He goes and picks up the chair, then turning on the still questioning Anna with a reassuring smile. Let you not be worried at all. Twas only a bit of an argument we was having to pass the time till you'd come. It must have been some argument when you got to throwing chairs. She turns on Chris. Why don't you say something? What was it about? Chris. Relaxing at last, avoiding her eyes. We was talking about ships and fallers on sea. Oh, the old stuff, eh? Burke, suddenly seeming to come to a bold decision, with a defiant grin at Chris. He's not after telling you the whole of it. We was arguing about you, mostly. About me? And we'd be finishing it out right here and now in your presence, if you're willing. He sits down at the left of table. Anna, looking from him to her father. Sure. Tell me what it's all about. Chris, advancing toward the table. No, you don't do that, you. You tell him you don't want for hear him talk, Anna. But I do. I want this cleared up. Well, not now, anyway. You was going ashore, yes. You ain't got time. Yes, right here and now. You tell me, Matt, since he don't want to. The whole of it's in a few words only. So as he'd make no mistake, and him hating the sight of me, I told him in his teeth I loved you. And that's God's truth, Anna, and well you know it. Ho, oh, oh, ho, he tells same tongue to gel every port he go. Anna, shrinking from her father with repulsion. Shut up, can't you? I know it's true, Matt. I don't mind what he says. Well, God bless you. And then what? And then, and then I said, I said I was sure. I told him... I thought you'd have a bit of love for me, too. Say you do, Anna. Let you not destroy me entirely for the love of God. He grasps both of her hands in his, too. So you told him that, Matt. No wonder he was mad. Well, maybe it's true, Matt. Maybe I do. I've been thinking and thinking. I didn't want to, Matt. I'll own up to that. I I tried to cut it out, but... <laughs> I guess I can't help it anyhow. So I guess I do, Matt. Sure I do. What's the use of kidding myself different? Sure I love you, Matt. Anna! He sits crushed. God be praised. And I ain't never loved a man in my life before. You can always believe that. No matter what happens. Burke goes over to her and puts his arms around her. Sure, I'd be believing every word you ever said, or ever will say. 
and tis you and me'll be having a grand beautiful life together to the end of our days he tries to kiss her at first she turns away her head then overcome by a fierce impulse of passionate love she takes his head in both her hands and holds his face close to hers staring into his eyes then she kisses him full on the lips anna pushing him away from her <sighs> goodbye she walks to the doorway in rear stands with her back toward them looking out her shoulders quiver once or twice as if she were fighting back her sobs burke too in the seventh heaven of bliss to get any correct interpretation of her word oh good boy is it the devil you say they'll be coming back at you in a second for more of the same to chris who has quickened to instant attention at his daughter's good-bye and has looked back at her with a stirring of foolish hope in his eyes now me old bucko what'll you be saying you heard the words from her own lips confess i bade you own up like a man when you're bait fair and square here's my hand to you now let you take it and we'll shake and forget what's over and done and be friends from this out i don't shake hands with you faller not while i live now the back of me hand to you then if that suits you better there's a rotten bad loser you are devil mend you i don't lose anna say she like you little bit but you don't hear her say she marry you a bit at the sound of her name anna has turned round to them her face is composed and calm again but it is the dead calm of despair no and i wasn't hearing her say the sun is shining either that's all right she don't say it just same anna coming forward to them no i didn't say it matt dare you hear you're waiting till you to be asked you mean well i'm asking you now and we'll be married this day with the help of god you heard what i said matt after i kissed you no i just remember i said goodbye that kiss was for goodbye matt what do you mean i can't marry you matt and we've said goodbye that's all i know it i know that was so anna is that making game of me you'd be tis a queer time to joke with me and don't be doing it for the love of god do you think i'd kid you now no i'm not joking matt i mean what i said you don't you can't tis mad you are i'm telling you no i'm not but what's come over you so sudden you were saying you loved me i'll say that as often as you want me to it's true then why what in the devil's name oh god help me i can't make head or tail to it at all because it's the best way out i can figure matt i've been thinking it over and thinking it over day and night all week don't think it ain't hard on me too matt for the love of god then tell me what is it that's preventing you wedding me where the two of us has love suddenly getting an idea and pointing at chris exasperatedly is it giving heed to the like of that old fool you are and him hating me and filling your ears full of bloody lies against me chris getting to his feet raging triumphantly before anna has a chance to get in a word yes anna believe me not you she know her old father don't lie like you anna turning on her father angrily you sit down you hear where do you come in butting in and making things worse you're like a devil you are oh, good lord and i was beginning to like you beginning to forget all i've got held up against you you ain't got nothing for hold against me anna ain't i just well let me tell you she glances at burke and stops abruptly say matt i'm surprised at you you didn't think anything he'd said Lisha, what else would it be think i've ever paid any attention to all his crazy bull gee you must take me for a five-year-old kid well, i don't know how to take you with your saying this one minute and that the next well he has nothing to do with it then what is it has tell me and don't keep me waiting and sweating blood i can't tell you and i won't i got a good reason and that's all you need to know i can't marry you that's all there is to it so for god's sake let's talk of something else i'll not there's a married to someone else you are in the west maybe i should say not to the devil with all of the reasons then they don't matter with me at all i'm thinking you're the like of them women can't make up their mind till they're drove to it well then i'll make up your mind for you bloody quick he takes her by the arms grinning to soften his serious bullying we've had enough of talk let you be going into your room now and dressing in your best and we'll be going ashore no pet god she don't do that takes hold of her arm anna 
who has listened to Burke in astonishment. She draws away from him, instinctively repelled by his tone, but not exactly sure if he is serious or not. Say, where do you get that stuff? Never mind now. Let you go and get dressed, I'm saying. Then turning to Chris. We'll be seeing who'll win in the end, me or you. You stay right here, Anna, you hear? Anna stands looking from one to the other of them, as if she thought they had both gone crazy. Then the expression of her face freezes into the hardened sneer of her experience. She'll not. She'll do what I say. You've had your hold on her long enough. It's my turn now. <laughs> your turn? Say, what am I, anyway? Tis not what you are. Tis what you're going to be this day. And that's wedded to me before night comes. Hurry up now with your dressing. You don't do one thing he say, Anna. She will so. I tell you she don't. I'm her father. She will in spite of you. She's taken my orders from this out, not yours. <laughs> orders is good. Hurry up now and shake a leg. We've no time to be wasting. Irritated as she doesn't move. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You stay there, Anna. You can go to hell, both of you. <laughs> You're just like all the rest of them. You too. God, you'd think I was a piece of furniture. I'll show you. Sit down now. Sit down and let me talk for a minute. You're all wrong, see? Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. And then I'm going to beat it. I'm going to tell you a funny story, so pay attention. Pointing to Chris. I've been meaning to turn it loose on him every time he'd get my goat with his bull about keeping me safe inland. I wasn't going to tell you. But you forced me into it. What's the diff? It's all wrong anyway, and you might as well get cured that way as any other. Only don't forget what you said a minute ago about it not mattering to you what other reason I got, so long as I wasn't married to no one else. That's my word, and I'll stick to it. <laughs> what a chance. You make me laugh, honest. Want to bet you will? Wait and see. First thing is, I want to tell you two guys something. He was going on as if one of you had to own me. But nobody owns me, see? Except in myself. I'll do what I please and no man, I don't give a hoot who he is, can tell me what to do. I ain't asking either of you for a living. I can make it myself. One way or another. I'm my own boss. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. You and your orders. I wasn't meaning it that way at all, and well you know it. You've no call to be raising this rumpus with me. Tis him you've a right. I'm coming to him. But you, you did mean it that way too. You sounded just like all the rest. But damn it, shut up. Let me talk for a change. Well, it is queer rough talk that for a decent girl like you. <laughs> decent? Who told you I was? Chris is sitting with bowed shoulders, his head in his hands. She leans over in exasperation and shakes him violently by the shoulder. Don't go to sleep, old man. Listen here, I'm talking to you now. Chris, straightening up and looking about, as if he were seeking a way to escape. I don't want for hear it. You was going out of head, I think, Anna. Well, living with you is enough to drive anyone off their nut. You're bunk about the farm being so fine. Didn't I write you year after year how rotten it was and what a dirty slave them cousins made of me? What did you care? Nothing. Not even enough to come out and see me. That crazy bull about wanting to keep me away from the sea don't go down with me. You just didn't want to be bothered with me. You're like all the rest of them. Anna, it ain't so. But one thing I never wrote to you. It was one of them cousins that you think is such nice people. The youngest son, Paul, that started me wrong. It wasn't none of my fault. I hated him worse than hell, and he knew it. But he was big and strong. Pointing to Burke. Like you. Burke, half springing to his feet, his fists clenched. God blast it! He sinks slowly back in his chair again, the knuckles showing white on his clenched hands, his face tense with the effort to suppress his grief and rage. Ah, uh, no! Nah. That was why I run away from the farm. That was what made me get a job as a nurse girl in St. Paul. <laughs> and you think that was a nice job for a girl too, don't you? 
With all them nice inland fellers just looking for a chance to marry me, I suppose. <laughs> marry me? What a chance. They wasn't looking for marrying. As Burke lets a groan of fury escape him. I'm owning up to everything fair and square. I was caged in, I tell you, just like in Yale, taking care of other people's kids, listening to them bawling and crying day and night when I wanted to be out. And I was lonesome, lonesome as hell. So I give up finally. What was the use? She stops and looks at the two men. Both are motionless and silent. Chris seems in a stupor of despair, his house of cards fallen about him. Burke's face is livid with the rage that is eating him up, but he is too stunned and bewildered yet to find a vent for it. The condemnation she feels in their silence goads Anna into a harsh, strident defiance. You don't say nothing, either of you, but I know what you're thinking. You're like all the rest. And who's to blame for it, me or you? If you'd even acted like a man, if you'd even been a regular father and had me with you, maybe things would be different. Don't talk that way, Anna. I go crazy. I won't listen. Puts his hands over his ears. You will too listen. She leans over and pulls his hands from his ears. You, keeping me safe inland. I wasn't no nurse girl the last two years. I lied when I wrote you. I was in a house, that's what. Yes, that kind of a house, the kind sailors like you and Matt go to in port. And your nice inland men, too. And all men, god damn them. I hate them. I hate them. <laughs> she breaks into hysterical sobbing, throwing herself into the chair and hiding her face in her hands on the table. The two men have sprung to their feet. Anna, Anna, it's lie, it's lie. He stands wringing his hands together and begins to weep. So that's what's in it. Suppose you remember your promise, Matt. No other reason was to count with you so long as I wasn't married already. So I suppose you want me to get dressed and go ashore, don't you? <laughs> yes, you do. God stiffen you. I suppose if I tried to tell you I wasn't... that... no more you'd believe me, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. And if I told you that just getting out in this barge and being on the sea had changed me and made me feel different about things... As if all I'd been through wasn't me, and didn't count, and was just like it never happened. You'd laugh, wouldn't you? And you'd die laughing, sure, if I said that meeting you that funny way that night in the fog, and afterwards seeing that you was straight good stock on me, had got me to thinking for the first time, and I sized you up as a different kind of man. A sea man is different from the ones on land as water is from mud. And that was why I got stuck on you, too. I wanted to marry you and fool you, but I couldn't. Don't you see how I've changed? I couldn't marry you with you believing a lie, and I was shamed to tell you the truth. Till the both of you forced my hand, and I seen you was the same as all the rest. And now give me a bawling out and beat it like I can tell you're going to. She stops, looking at Burke. He is silent, his face averted, his features beginning to work with fury. Will you believe it if I tell you that loving you has made me clean? It's the straight goods, honest. Like hell you will. You're like all the rest. Burke, turning on her in a perfect frenzy of rage. The rest is it. God's curse on you. Clean is it. Yes, yeah, slut you. I'll be killing you now. He picks up the chair on which he has been sitting and swinging it high over his shoulder springs toward her. Chris rushes forward with a cry of alarm, trying to ward off the blow from his daughter. Anna looks up into Burke's eyes with the fearlessness of despair. Burke checks himself, the chair held in the air. Stop, you crazy fool! You want for murder her? Anna, pushing her father away brusquely, her eyes still holding Burke's. Keep out of this, you. Well, ain't you got the nerve to do it? Go ahead. I'll be thankful to you, honest. I'm sick of the whole game. Burke, throwing the chair away into a corner of the room. I can't do it, God help me, and your two eyes looking at me. 
though i do be thinking i'd have a good right to smash your skull like a rotten egg was there ever a woman in the world had the rottenness in her that you have and was there ever a man the like of me made the fool of the world and me thinking thoughts about you and having great love for you and dreaming dreams of the fine life we'd have when we'd be wedded yet a god help me i'm destroyed entirely and my heart is broken in bits the asking god himself was it for this he'd have me roam in the earth since i was a lad only to come to black shame in the end where i'd be given a power of love to a woman is the same as others you'd meet in any hook or shanty in port with red gowns on them and paint on their grinning mugs to be sleeping with any man for a dollar or two don't matt oh for god's sake <laughs> Get out of here! Leave me alone! Get out of here! I'll be going, surely, and I'll be drinking slews of whiskey will wash the black kiss of yours off my lips, and I'll be getting dead rotten drunk so as I'll not remember t'was ever born you was at all, and I'll be shipping away on some boat will take me to the other end of the world where I'll never see your face again. He turns toward the door. Chris, who has been standing in a stupor, suddenly grasping Burke by the arm. No, you don't go. I thank my meat's better Anna marry you now. Burke, shaking Chris off. They've go of me, you old ape. Marry her, is it? I'd see her roasted in hell first. I'm shipping the way out of this, I'm telling you. And my curse on you and the curse of Almighty God and all the saints. You've destroyed me this day, and may you lie awake in the long night tormented with thoughts of Matt Burke and the great wrong you've done him. Matt! But he turns without another word and strides out of the doorway. Anna looks after him wildly, starts to run after him, then hides her face in her outstretched arms, sobbing. Chris stands in a stupor, staring at the floor. I think I go ashore, too. Not after him. Let him go, don't you dare. I go for that drink. So I'm driving you to drink, too, eh? I suppose you want to get drunk so you can forget. Like him? Yes, I want you tank. I like hear them tanks. I tank you wasn't that kind of girl, Anna. And I suppose you want me to beat it, don't you? You don't want me here disgracing you, I suppose. No, you stay here. Goes over and pats her on the shoulder, the tears running down his face. Ain't your fault, Anna, I know that. She looks up at him, softened. He bursts into rage. It's that old devil see do this to me. He shakes his fist again. It's her dirty tricks. It was all right on barge with just you and me. Then she bring that Irish feller in fog. She make you like him. She make you fight with me all time. If that Irish feller don't never come, you don't never tell me them tongues. I don't never know, and every tongue's all right. Dirty old devil! Oh, what's the use? Go on ashore and get drunk. Chris goes into room on left and gets his cap. He goes to the door, silent and stupid, then turns. You white here, Anna? Maybe. And maybe not. Maybe I'll get drunk, too. Maybe I'll... But what the hell do you care what I do? Go on and beat it. Chris turns stupidly and goes out. Anna sits at the table, staring straight in front of her. The curtain falls. End of Act Three Act Four of Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene. Same as Act Three, about nine o'clock of a foggy night two days later. The whistles of steamers in the harbor can be heard. The cabin is lighted by a small lamp on the table. A suitcase stands in the middle of the floor. Anna is sitting in the rocking chair. She wears a hat, is all dressed up as in Act One. Her face is pale, looks terribly tired and worn, as if the two days just past had been ones of suffering and sleepless nights. She stares before her despondently, her chin in her hands. 
There is a timid knock on the door in rear. Anna jumps to her feet with a startled exclamation and looks toward the door with an expression of mingled hope and fear. Come in. Come in. The door is opened and Chris appears in the doorway. He is in a very bleary, bedraggled condition, suffering from the after-effects of his drunk. A tin pail full of foaming beer is in his hand. He comes forward, his eyes avoiding Anna's. He mutters stupidly, It's foggy. So you come back at last, did you? You're a fine-looking sight. I thought you'd beaten it for good on account of the disgrace I'd brought on you. Don't sigh that, Anna, please. He sits in a chair by the table, setting down the can of beer, holding his head in his hands. What's the trouble? Feeling sick? Inside my head feels sick. Well, what do you expect after being soused for two days? It serves you right. A fine thing you leaving me alone on this barge all that time. I'm sorry, Anna. Sorry? But I'm not sick inside head by you mean. I'm sick from tank too much about you, about me. And how about me? Do you suppose I ain't been thinking too? I'm sorry, Anna. Is her bag and gives a start. You pack your bag, Anna? You was going? Yes. I was going right back to what you think. Anna! I went ashore to get a train for New York. I've been waiting and waiting till I was sick of it. Then I changed my mind and decided not to go today. But I'm going first thing tomorrow, so it'll all be the same in the end. No, you never do that, Anna. Why not, I'd like to know. You don't never got to do that way, no more. I tell you, I'll fix that up all right. Fix what up? You was waiting, you say. You wasn't waiting for me, I bet. You'd win. For that Irish feller? Yes, if you want to know. If he did come back, it'd only be because he wanted to beat me up or kill me, I suppose. But even if he did, I'd rather have him come than not show up at all. I wouldn't care what he did. I guess it's true you was in love with him all right. You guess? And I'm sorry for you like hell he don't come, Anna. Seems to me you've changed your tune a lot. I've been tanking, and I guess it was all my fault. All bad tongues that happen to you. You try for not hate me, Anna. I'm crazy old fool, that's all. Who said I hated you? I'm sorry for every tongue. I do wrong for you, Anna. I want for you be happy all rest of your life for make up. It make you happy marry that Irish feller. I want it too. Well, there ain't no chance. But I'm glad you think different about it anyway. And you thank maybe you forgive me sometime? I'll forgive you right now. Chris, seizing her hand and kissing it. Anna Lilla, Anna Lilla. Don't bawl about it. There ain't nothing to forgive anyway. It ain't your fault, and it ain't mine. And it ain't his neither. We're all poor nuts and things happen. And we just get mixed in wrong, that's all. You say right, Tang, Anna, by golly. It ain't nobody's fault. Shaking his fist. It's that old devil, see. <sighs> Gee, won't you ever can that stuff? Chris relapses into injured silence. After a pause, Anna continues curiously. You said a minute ago you'd fixed something up. About me. What was it? I'm shipping away on sea again, Anna. Your what? I sign on steamer sail tomorrow. I got my old job, bosun. Anna stares at him. As he goes on, a bitter smile comes over her face. I thank that's best tongue for you. I only bring you bad luck, I thank. I make your mother's life sorry. I don't want make yours that way. But I do just same. That old devil see, she makes me Yona man, ain't no good for nobody. And I thank now it ain't no use fight be see. No man that live going to beat her, pie jingo. <laughs> so that's how you fixed me, is it? 
Yes, I thank if that old devil got me back. She leave you alone then. But for God's sake, don't you see? You're doing the same thing you've always done. Don't you see? But she sees the look of obsessed stubbornness on her father's face and gives it up helplessly. But what's the use of talking? You ain't right, that's what. I'll never blame you for nothing no more. But how could you figure out that was fixin' me? That ain't all. I got them fellers in steamship office to pay you all money coming to me every month while I'm away. <laughs> Thanks. But I guess I won't be hard up for no small change. It ain't much, I know. But it's plenty for keep you so you never got go. Shut up, will you? We'll talk about it later, see? You like I go ashore look for that Irish feller, Anna? Not much. Think I want to drag him back? Pa golly, that boots don't go veil. Give me fever. I thank. I feel hot like hell. He takes off his coat and lets it drop on the floor. There is a loud thud. What you got in your pocket, for Pete's sake? A ton of lead? She reaches down, takes the coat, and pulls out a revolver, looks from it to him in amazement. A gun? What were you going to do with that? I forgot. Ain't nothing. Ain't loaded anyway. Anna, breaking it open to make sure, then closing it again, looking at him suspiciously. That ain't telling me why you got it. I'm all fool. I got it when I go ashore first. I thank then it's all fault of that Irish feller. Oh, say you're crazier than I thought. I never dreamt you'd go that far. I don't. I got better sense right away. I don't never buy bullets even. It ain't his fault, I know. Well, I'll take care of this for a while, loaded or not. She puts it in the drawer of table and closes the drawer. Throw it overboard if you want. I don't care. Pike golly, I tank I go lie down. I feel sick. Anna takes a magazine from the table. Chris hesitates by her chair. We talk again before I go, yes? Where's the ship going to? Cape Town. That's in South Africa. She's British steamer called London Derry. Anna, you forgive me, sure? Sure I do. You ain't to blame. You're just what you are, like me. Then you let me kiss you again once? Anna, raising her face, forcing a wan smile. Sure. No hard feelings. Chris kisses her, brokenly. Anna Lilla, I, I can't say it. Good night, Anna. Good night. He picks up the can of beer and goes slowly into the room on left, his shoulders bowed, his head sunk forward dejectedly. He closes the door after him. Anna turns over the pages of the magazine, trying desperately to banish her thoughts by looking at the pictures. This fails to distract her, and flinging the magazine back on the table, she springs to her feet and walks about the cabin distractedly, clenching and unclenching her hands. She speaks aloud to herself in a tense, trembling voice. God, I can't stand this much longer. What am I waiting for anyway? Like a damn fool. <laughs> she laughs helplessly, then checks herself abruptly as she hears the sound of heavy footsteps on the deck outside. She appears to recognize these, and her face lights up with joy. She gasps. Matt! A strange terror seems suddenly to seize her. She rushes to the table, takes the revolver out of drawer, and crouches down in the corner left behind the cupboard. A moment later the door is flung open, and Matt Burke appears in the doorway. He is in bad shape, his clothes torn and dirty, covered with sawdust as if he had been groveling or sleeping on barroom floors. There is a red bruise on his forehead over one of his eyes, another over one cheekbone. His knuckles are skinned and raw, plain evidence of the fighting he has been through on his bat. His eyes are bloodshot and heavy-lidded. His face has a bloated look. But beyond these appearances, the results of heavy drinking, there is an expression in his eyes of wild mental turmoil, of impotent animal rage baffled by its own abject misery. Burke. 
peers blinkingly about the cabin. Let you not be hiding from me, whoever's here. Don't as well you know I'd have a right to come back and murder you. He stops to listen. Hearing no sound, he closes the door behind him and comes forward to the table. He throws himself into the rocking chair. <sighs> There's no one here, I'm thinking. And tis a great fool I am to be coming. Yet I'm at work. Tis a great jackass you've become, and what's got into you at all at all. She's gone out of this long ago, I'm telling you, and you'll never see her face again. Anna stands up, hesitating, struggling between joy and fear. Burke's eyes fall on Anna's bag. He leans over to examine it. What's this? It's hers. She's not gone. But where is she? Ashore? What would she be doing ashore on this rotten night? That's it, is it? Ah, God's curse on her. I'll wait till she comes and choke her dirty life out. Anna starts. Her face grows hard. She steps into the room, the revolver in her right hand by her side. What are you doing here? Glory be to God. They remain motionless and silent for a moment, holding each other's eyes. Well, can't you talk? Every year's growth scared out of me, coming at me so sudden and me thinking I was alone. You've got your nerve butting in here without knocking or nothing. What do you want? Well, nothing much. I was wanting to have a last word with you, that's all. He moves a step toward her. Anna, raising the revolver in her hand. Careful now. Don't try getting too close. I heard what you said you'd do to me. Is it murdering me you'd be now? God forgive you. Nor is it thinking I'd be frightened by that old tin whistle. He walks straight for her. Look out, I tell you. Burke, who has come so close that the revolver is almost touching his chest. Let you shoot, then. Let you shoot, I'm saying, and be done with it. Let you end me with a shot and I'll be thanking you. For it's a rotten dog's life I've lived the past two days since I've known what you are. Till I'm after wishing I was never born at all. Anna, overcome, letting the revolver drop to the floor as if her fingers had no strength to hold it. What do you want coming here? Why don't you beat it? Go on! She passes him and sinks down in the rocking chair. Tis right you'd be asking why did I come. "'Tis because tis a great weak fool of the world I am, "'and me tormented with the wickedness you told of yourself, "'and drinking oceans of booze that'd make me forget. "'Forget? Divil a word I'd forget, "'and your face grinning always in front of my eyes, awake or asleep, "'till I'd be thinking a madhouse is a proper place for me.' "'You look like you ought to be put away some place. "'Wonder you wasn't pulled in. "'You been scrapping too, ain't you?' "'I have. "'What every scut would take his coat off to me.' And each time I'd be hitting one a clout in the mug, it wasn't his face I'd be seeing at all, but yours. And me wanting to drive you a blow would knock you out of this world, where I wouldn't be seeing or thinking more of you. Thanks. That's right, make game of me. Oh, I'm a great coward, surely, to be coming back to speak with you at all. You've a right to laugh at me. I ain't laughing at you, Matt. You to be what you are, and me to be Matt Bourke, and me to be drove back to look at you again. This black shame is on me. Then get out. No one's holding you. And me to listen to that talk from a woman like you and to be frightened to close her mouth with a slap. Ah, God help me. I'm a yellow coward for all men to spit at. But I'll not be getting out of this till I've had me word. Raising his fist threateningly. And let you look out how you drive me. Letting his fist fall helplessly. Don't be angry now. I'm raving like a real lunatic, I'm thinking. And the sorrow you put in me has my brains drowned in grief. Suddenly bending down to her and grasping her arm intensely. Tell me it's a lie I'm saying. That's what I'm after coming to hear you say. A lie? What? All the badness you told me two days back. Sure it must be a lie. You was only making game of me, wasn't you? Tell me twas a lie, Anna, and I'll be saying prayers that hangs on me two knees to the almighty God. I can't, Matt. As he turns away. Oh, Matt, won't you see that no matter what I was, I ain't that way any more. Why, listen, I packed up my bag this afternoon and went ashore. I've been waiting here all alone for two days, maybe thinking you'd come back, thinking maybe you'd think over all I'd said, and maybe... Oh, I don't know what I was hoping. But I was afraid to even go out of the cabin for a second, honest, afraid you might come and not find me here. Then I gave up hope when you didn't show up and I went to the railroad station. I was going to New York. I was going back. That's course on you. Listen, Matt, you hadn't come, and I'd gave up hope. But in the station, I couldn't go. I'd bought my ticket and everything. She takes the ticket from her dress and tries to hold it before his eyes. 
but I got to thinking about you. And I couldn't take the train, I couldn't. So I come back here to wait some more. Oh, Matt, don't you see I've changed? Can't you forgive what's dead and gone and forget it? Forget, is it? I'll not forget till my dying day, I'm telling you, and me tormented with thoughts. Oh, I'm wishing I had one of them for an ends me this minute, and I'd beat him with my fist till he'd be a bloody corpse. I'm wishing the whole lot of them will roast in hell to the judgment day, and yourself along with them, for you're as bad as they are. Matt. Well, you've had your say. Now you better beat it. Burke starts slowly for the door. Hesitates. And what'll you be doing? What difference does it make to you? I'm asking you. My bag's packed and I got my ticket. I'll go to New York tomorrow. You mean, you'll be doing the same again? Yes. You'll not. Don't torment me with that talk. Tis a she-devil you are sent to drive me mad entirely. Oh, for God's sake, Matt, leave me alone. Go away. Don't you see I'm licked? Why do you want to keep on kicking me? Now, don't you deserve the worst, I'd say. God forgive you. All right, maybe I do. But don't rub it in. Why ain't you done what you said you was going to? Why ain't you got that ship was going to take you to the other side of the earth where you'd never see me again? I have. What? Then you're going? Honest? I signed on today at noon, drunk as I was, and she's sailing tomorrow. And where's she going to? Cape Town. Cape Town? Where's that? Far away? Tis at the end of Africa. That's far for you. <laughs> you're keeping your word all right, ain't you? What's the boat's name? The Londonderry. The Londonderry? It's the same. Oh, this is too much. <laughs> What's up with you now? <laughs> it's funny. Funny I'll die laughing. <laughs> laughing at what? It's a secret. You'll know soon enough. It's funny. What kind of place is this Cape Town? Plenty of dames there, I suppose. Ah, oh, to hell with them. That I may never see another woman to my dying hour. That's what you say now. But I'll bet by the time you get there, you'll have forgot all about me and start in talking the same old bull you talk to me to the first one you meet. Well, not then. God mend you. Is it making me out to be like yourself, you are? And you take it up with this one and that one all the years of your life? Yes, that's just what I do mean. You've been doing the same thing all your life, picking up a new girl in every port. How are you any better than I was? Is it no shame you have at all? I'm a fool to be wasting talk on you, and you hardened in badness. I'll go out of this and leave you alone forever. He starts for the door, then stops to turn on her furiously. And I suppose tis the same lies you told them all before that you told to me. That's a lie. I never did. Uh, you'll be saying that anyway. Are you trying to accuse me of being in love? Really in love with them? I'm thinking you were, surely. You mutt you. I've stood enough from you. Don't you dare. Love him? Oh my God, you damn thickhead. Love him? I hated him, I tell you. Hated him. Hated him. Hated him. And may God strike me dead this minute, and my mother too, if she was alive, if I ain't telling you the honest truth. If I could only be believing you now. Oh, what's the use? What's the use of me talking? What's the use of anything? Oh, Matt, you mustn't think that for a second. You mustn't. Think all the other bad about me you want to, and I won't kick because you've a right to. But don't think that. I couldn't bear it. It'd be just too much to know you was going away where I'd never see you again. Thinking that about me. If I was believing that you'd never had love for any other man in the world but me, I could be forgetting the rest, maybe. Matt! If tis truth you're after telling, I'd have a right, maybe, to believe you'd changed, and that I'd change you myself till the thing you'd been all your life wouldn't be you any more at all. Oh, Matt, that's what I've been trying to tell you all along. For if a power has strengthened me to lead men the way I want, and women too, maybe, and I'm thinking I'd change you to a new woman entirely, so I'd never know, or you either, what kind of woman you'd been in the past at all. Yes, you could, Matt. I know you could. Then I'm thinking, twasn't your fault, maybe. But having that old ape for a father that left you grow up alone, made you what you was. And if I could be believing, tis only me, you... you got to believe it, Matt. What can I do? I'll do anything, anything to prove I'm not lying. Burke 
suddenly seems to have a solution. He feels in the pocket of his coat and grasps something. Would you be willing to swear an oath, though a terrible fearful oath would send your soul to the devils in hell if you was lying? Sure I'll swear, Matt, on anything. Burke takes a small, cheap old crucifix from his pocket and holds it up for her to see. Will you swear on this? Yes, sure I will. Give it to me. Tis a cross was given to me by me mother. God rest her soul. I was a lad only, and she told me to keep it by me if I'd be waking or sleeping and never lose it, and it'd bring me luck. She died soon after. But I'm after keeping it with me from that day till this, and I'm telling you there's great power in it, and tis great bad luck it saved me from, and me roaming the seas, and I having it tied round my neck when my last ship sunk, and it bringing me safe to land when the others went to their death. And I'm warning you now, if you'd swear an oath on this, tis my old woman herself will be looking down from heaven above, and praying God Almighty and the saints to put a great curse on you if she'd hear you swearing a lie. I wouldn't have the nerve. Honest, if it was a lie. But it's the truth, and I ain't scared to swear. Give it to me. Burke, handing it to her, almost frightenedly, as if he feared for her safety. Be careful what you'd swear, I'm saying. Anna, holding the cross gingerly. Well, what do you want me to swear? You say it. Swear I'm the only man in the world ever you felt love for. I swear it. And that you'll be forgetting from this day all the badness you've done and never do the like of it again. I swear it. I swear by God. And may the blackest curse of God strike you if you're lying. Say it now. And may the blackest curse of God strike me if I'm lying. Oh, glory be to God. I'm after believing you now. He takes the cross from her hand, his face beaming with joy, and puts it back in his pocket. He puts his arm about her waist and is about to kiss her when he stops, appalled by some terrible doubt. What's the matter with you? There's a Catholic you are. No. Why? Ah, oh, God help me. There's some devil's trickery in it. To be swearing an oath on a Catholic cross and you one of the others. Oh, Matt, don't you believe me? If it isn't Catholic you are. I ain't nothing. What's the difference? Didn't you hear me swear? Ah, oh, I'd a right to stay away from you, but I couldn't. I was loving you in spite of it and wanted to be with you, God forgive me, no matter what you are. I'd go mad if I'd not have you. I'd be killing the world. He seizes her in his arms and kisses her fiercely. Matt! Burke, suddenly holding her away from him and staring into her eyes as if to probe into her soul. If your oath is no proper oath at all, I'll have to be taking your naked word for it and have you anyway, I'm thinking. I'm needing you that bad. Matt, I swore, didn't I? Both or no oath, tis no matter. We'll be wedded in the morning with the help of God. We'll be happy now, the two of us, in spite of the devil. He crushes her to him and kisses her again. The door on the left is pushed open and Chris appears in the doorway. He stands blinking at them. At first the old expression of hatred of Burke comes into his eyes instinctively. Then a look of resignation and relief takes its place. His face lights up with a sudden happy thought. He turns back into the bedroom, reappears immediately with the tin can of beer in his hand, grinning. Me have drink on this, by golly! They break away from each other with startled exclamations. God stiffen it! He takes a step toward Chris, threateningly. That's the way to talk. And say, it's about time for you and Matt to kiss and make up. You're going to be shipmates on the London Dairy, did you know it? Shipmates? Has himself... I was pushing on her. The devil. You'd be going back to sea and leaving her alone, would you? It's all right, Matt. That's where he belongs, and I want him to go. You gotta go, too. We'll need the money. <laughs> and as for me being alone, it runs in the family, and I'll get used to it. Pouring out their glasses. I'll get a little house somewhere, and I'll make a regular place for you two to come back to. Wait and see. And now you drink up and be friends. Uh, sure clinking his glass against Chris's. Here's luck to you. He drinks. Skull. He drinks. You'll not be lonesome long. I'll see to that with the help of God. Tis himself here will be having a grandchild to ride on his foot, I'm telling you. Quit the kidding now. She picks up her bag and goes into the room on left. As soon as she is gone, Burke relapses into an attitude of gloomy thought. Chris stares at his beer absent-mindedly. Finally, Burke turns on him. Is there any religion you have at all, you and your Anna? Why, yes. We was Lutheran in all country. Luther's, is it? 
Well, damn then, surely. Yeah, what's the difference? Tis the will of God, anyway. Chris, moodily preoccupied with his own thoughts, speaks with sombre premonition as Anna re-enters from the left. It's funny, it's queer, yes. You and me shipping on same boat that way. It ain't right, I don't know. It's that funny way old devil see do her worst dirty tricks, yes. It's so. He gets up and goes back, and, opening the door, stares out into the darkness. Burke, nodding his head in gloomy acquiescence. I'm fearing maybe you had the right of it for once, devil take you. Gee, Matt, you ain't agreeing with him, are you? She comes forward and puts her arm about his shoulder, with a determined gaiety. Aw, oh, say, what's the matter? Cut out the gloom. We're all fixed now, ain't we, me and you? Pours out more beer into his glass and fills one for herself. Slaps him on the back. Come on. Here's to the sea, no matter what. Be a game sport and drink to that. Come on. She gulps down her glass. Burke banishes his superstitious premonitions with a defiant jerk of his head, grins up at her, and drinks to her toast. Chris, looking out into the night, lost in his somber preoccupation, shakes his head and mutters, Fog, fog, fog all bloody time. You can't see where you was going, no. Only that old devil see. She knows. The two stare at him. From the harbor comes the muffled, mournful wail of steamer's whistles. The curtain falls. End of Act Four End of Anna Christie by Eugene O'Neill